The next presenter who will give you the insights and what you need to know about AI, ML, and when to use it in a smart way. So please, round of applause. Thank you. All right. Oh, right, I'm mic'd. Um, excellent. Okay, so uh, my title obviously has changed a little bit from the pamphlet, um, but basically I'll be giving a thesis about how do you um, frame the developments and the bag of tools and architectures and models that came out of deep learning the last couple of years um, in, in a way that helps you think about the applications that can come out of it. So I call it differentiable programming. It's been referred to some as software 2.0. Um, and I couch it as a framework for AI, deep learning, and machine intelligence applications. So I know that this audience is supposed to be primarily composed of startup founders or people who are thinking about founding startups, so I wanted to cater towards a perspective on how this can be adopted by founders um, as they're thinking about AI products and, uh, and companies. So first, a little bit about my background. Um, I am an investor with Amplify Partners. Uh, we're an early stage seed and series A focused venture firm that invests in en enterprise startups. So only B2B. It also focuses on infrastructure, compute, um, security, and machine intelligence applications. So we're very focused on a particular set uh, of startups. Um, some of these investments include Determined AI, which does um, deployment of deep learning models on-prem. Uh, Primer, which uh, does text summarization from diverse modalities, and covariant AI, formerly named embodied intelligence, which applies deep reinforcement learning to robotics in manufacturing. So uh, I also had uh, finished my PhD at UC Berkeley in statistics and deep learning. Was a mathematician once upon a time. Now turned investor. I'm juggling kind of two slides here because I have my notes on my computer and the one collected. So um, don't mind the uh, fluidity here. So um, to start the story, I want to take what seems at first blush a detour. Um, this shape right here is uh, known by mathematicians as a Gombach. So it solves a delicate optimization. In particular, if you want to think about um, or rather, the optimization is best understood uh, by considering these balancing dolls. So we're all familiar with this. This is a childhood toy. Um, they have one stable point of balance on the bottom. So what that means is if you push them, it'll kind of right itself. Uh, and it does this because it has most of its weight centered near the bottom um, where it sits. So a mathematician might look at this property of the doll and ask, uh, can this hold for a shape that is completely homogeneous and um, you know, uh, a concave shape, because the stall also like, looks a little bit, you know, it's shaped uh, more intricately. So um, when you actually think about this qu uh, question, you look at the sphere in a cube as shapes that come to mind immediately, and they don't satisfy this property. So it's not actually something that's easy to come up with. And so the solution actually turns out to be uh, surprisingly beautiful. It, it is actually satisfied by the shape that I showed previously, the Gombach. So, this shape has a single point, a stable point of equilibrium. It's on the bottom. No matter how you push it, it will write itself on the bottom. And what is interesting about this object for the purposes of this talk is that it took modern computational methods um, and modern computational optimization to find the solution. So in particular, the ability to rapidly test hypotheses, iterate ideas, and get feedback. Um, it's very hard to explore the space of optimization, just kind of you know, in your head or analytically through expressing it in terms of functions. So such optimization programs helps us explore a complex space, a non-intuitively space of solutions, and arrive at a better optimization. So I argue that the body of tools, architectures, models um, developed in recent years um, in deep learning holds similar power. Um, and it is this body of work um, that is best understood through the framework of differentiable programming, which I'll present here. So first off, what is differentiable programming? Um, Yuan Lun Kuhn, which is one of the, uh, you know, I guess godfathers at this point of deep learning, uh, mentioned a couple months ago that deep learning is dead, so vive differentiable programming. Um, and he went on to sort of define what it means uh, 
So people are now building a new kind of software by assembling networks of parameterized functional blocks and uh, by training them from examples using some form of gradient-based optimization. An increasingly large number of people are defining the networks procedurally in a data-dependent way, allowing them to change dynamically as a function of the input data fed to them. It's really very much like a regular program, except for it's parameterized, automatically differentiated, and trainable and optimizable. And another source, um, you know, as and Andre Karpahevi put it, more um, in another uh, quote in a blog post about software 2.0. So in particular, he noted that neural networks are not just another classifier. They're just not, a, not just another model or you know, way to do statistical uh, learning. They represent the beginning of fundamental shift in how we write software. They are software 2.0. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to try to outline for you what I think are the important uh, principles within uh, this paradigm. So let's start by establishing that differentiable programming is not just a bag of architectures and models. It is a bag of, not just a bag of tools, but rather a conceptual apparatus for how to apply these tools. And the results may seem diverse and unrelated. So for instance, you know, AlphaGo to robotics to drug discovery enterprise infrastructure. But uh, my goal for this talk is to make these future progress and directions more comprehensible to a business audience or a startup audience uh, beyond the bag of great results. So let's jump into it. So um, three principles that I, I want to really highlight that are important in this kind of paradigm shift is uh, first off, feature engineering is done by optimization. So uh, in other words, um, well, well, actually, I'll go into detail later. Um, and then second, it's very suitable to end-to-end -end applications. And finally, it has an incredible potential as a generative method. So examples to follow. Just juggling two slides here. OK, so feature engineering is done by optimization. Um, this is really the dream of both, I guess, machine learning in the beginning and, and differentiable programming. So, what I guess I sometimes mean by you get to be really dumb by getting a little smarter. So uh, the key here is that architectures that are expressive enough to create good representations of different types of inputs, they, um, they get you to do a level of, of abstraction that um, basically even allow you to do algorithm design from uh, neural networks. And that's kind of ex what's exciting about uh, this. So what are some examples? Some of you might be familiar with this example, but it came from a more um, it came from work done within Google Brain, uh, neural network architecture search. So um, what you what they did here is they used a sequence to sequence model to design from scratch a neural network for uh, image data as well as language data, um, but it trained basically many different models um, in parallel and used the accuracy of these models as feedback signal to determine whether these design choices were good. So instead of having an army of research scientists finding, designing these architectures, you could completely parameterize that entire search space and do that, search space and do that automatically. So that's what I mean by the level of abstraction, getting to the level of model design um, themselves. And in this case, uh, you can go into the paper um, in, uh, if you want to look for details, but in this case, it actually performed better than the models that were hyper-optimized by a group of researchers for several years in case of both image and language data. So it's super fascinating. Um, also, what's kind of interesting here is that sometimes they the machine, without giving a lot of input, was able to arrive at similar modules of architectures, such as like LSTMs. They sort of designed something that looked similar to an LSTM. So it, it also gives you a degree of, uh, I guess, um, verification that some of the things that you arrived at, um, in your, in, in, that humans arrived at, were actually a stable point of optimization. OK. So next example, um, this is one of the more attention-grabbing uh, results that came out of NIPS uh, this past December. Uh, in particular, the key idea here is that these results, um, there is this you know, classical uh, group of data structures and functions that are provably optimal for a general set of distributions, or worst case scenarios, but which might not be optimal if you have a better understanding of the distribution that your you know, customer base or wherever particular data set is exposed to. And so they sort of 
um, instead designed um, a neural net model to learn the sort order or structure of lookup keys and use this signal to effectively predict the position or existence of records. So they turned this into a, a machine learning problem. Uh, so despite this, you know, there's certain criticisms about the paper, but it, it's uh, the, the, the general kind of important key remains is that you get to um, explore how differentiable programming can dif fundamentally change even the most fundamental um, building blocks of computer science. So it's really exciting where you can apply this, not just to traditional AI problems like vision or NLP, uh, but basically anywhere where you can kind of gather quality data and then effectively work it into your workflow. So next example, oh, uh, you know, being coming from mathematics uh, background, uh, partial to just saying like it not, it's not even in just you know business and data structures, but why I came into this field was I found it was interesting even as a from an algorithmic point of view, you can use um, collecting the right data sets to define algorithms. So in, in mathematics, we have um, an interest in clustering certain sparse graphs. It's, um, and uh, especially in regimes where sparsity reaches to a point where detection is not possible. And so kind of glossing over the details, long story short, there's certain kind of like spectral motiva motivations to, to, to help you design a type of architecture that is expressive enough uh, to um, capture some of these algorithms. And then we used it, we used a gradient uh, uh, descent based method to be able to actually not only retrieve the state of the art architecture, but apply it to a broader uh, class of models. So it, it really, this kind of philosophy of getting the right parameter space of models to learn your problem is, is very generalizable. So it goes into the abstract reaches of mathematics. Um, so on now our second point of uh, what does, you know, what's special about differentiable programming as a paradigm, um, it's very suitable for end-to-end -end approaches. So um, end-to-end approaches are conceptually and mathematically elegant. So the system is trained in a holistic manner based on a single principle. So every step then is decided um, by the final goal rather than feature engineered or kind of defined at different sort of junctions. So um, in, in this sense, there's no need to train modules on an auxiliary objective that you might find sensible. And sometimes this helps for like training in, in, in a cold start problem. But if you can, if you can subsume a, an entire process under an end-to-end -end approach, sometimes uh, you find that it actually works way better. And so, um, I'll try to give more intuition for why that should be, but just to make, you know, we, let's jump into examples so we can anchor uh, from the abstract. So in, um, there was a couple of papers coming out from I think Microsoft and Facebook that used reinforcement learning, or rather deep reinforcement learning to optimize for engagement on web pages. So, um, you know, this stuff is still maybe more of in its infancy because the infrastructure that's needed to deploy this kind of stuff is still maybe the, the biggest bottleneck. But um, just to kind of illustrate what this is, is you allow for an optimization space of what to change in the page to be far more comprehensive if you cast it as an end-to-end -end problem. And if we have enough data, we can actually do better. So shown in this paper is that it actually performed better than just traditional um, A-B testing. And you can kind of couch it into what the details of that comparison are, but um, they showed some, something astronomical, like a 70% lift than what they were just doing in-house with a data science team. So I think that's fairly interesting. Um, so what content to serve is an example of an end-to-end -end approach. Um, this we should all be very familiar with at, uh, at this point, AlphaGo Zero. Um, a, you know, not, n a departure even from AlphaGo originally, which is that you use one model, uh, this convolutional neural network model, to train both the policy of what to do on the moves and also have intuition for the value of the board itself. And so uh, why is this an end-to-end -end approach? Well, the input is just the raw pixels of the board, and you were able to train this model to perform better than the top Go players. So I mean, Go, I mean, this is actually what kind of grabbed me about um, uh, deep learning methods and why I thought it was so promising because Go is really held in um, you know Eastern culture, China, Korea, Japan as one of the highest um, you know four kind of arts to pursue. So it's really not only mathematically impossible to brute force, but really regarded as a very lofty intellectual pursuit. So we're able to train a model from without even expert data, just against self play in this end-to-end -end approach to uh, to perform better than the the highest kind of uh, one done players. Rather extraordinary. Um, and then finally, getting to more of a 
traditional application, um, automated farming. So uh, also an application of uh, reinforcement learning. Robots move the seedlings around. You have better sensors. Um, you can, the input is basically the soil sensors and, and, and maybe images of the plants, all of these data that you can have access to, and then you try to automate the process of like how do you better um, you know, achieve a, a plant that grows um, efficiently in a certain amount of time. So this is not to say that currently the solution is end-to-end, uh, is -end, but it's something that is amenable to the approach. And so when you think about startup ideas, like how do you kind of design a workflow that you can automate um, and, and, and try to use a model to kind of optimize the entire process, uh, even these more traditional applications uh, are, are amenable to that. Okay, so um, I guess the talk to far uh, on farming, uh, I said in the beginning that I paint more of an intuition for why this should end to end is even better than trying to do it more um, independently. So on farming, we're exposing ourselves to reinforcement learning applied to robotics, and so in the case of um, deep reinforcement learning applied to robotics, um, you have these results by uh, Sergey Levin, Chelsea Finn, Trevor Darrow, Peter Abiel at, at uh, Berkeley, and they found that this end-to-end -end approach really just tosses a lot of the represent representational junk that would have accumulated if you just trained a visual model and then you tried to train the policy. So by doing an end-to-end -end approach, you kind of just got rid of some of the things that were just extra, that weren't needed to train the policy. And so you actually were, uh, sort of expose yourself to more data efficiency as well. So um, yeah, there's research evidence that an end-to-end -end approach is, um, is, if you can structure the data collection correctly, is actually more uh, sample efficient. So I guess one quote is as we bring software that we only have to write once ahead of, ahead of time for all applications. That's a paradigm shift from needing to program for every specific task to programming once and then just doing data collection either through demonstrations or reinforcement learning. So uh, highlighting the bigger point that this is also not brute forcing the task. It's like very adaptable to data and it's supposed to be generalizable too because your architecture is extremely uh, rich in the representations that it could uh, summarize. So on to the last and perhaps the more fun um, point is that it has differentiable programming has incredible potential as a generative method. So um, its ability to learn very good approximations um, to the data distribution gives differentiable programming a huge edge in creating artificially generated examples. And this, I think, is best illustrated. It's hard to maybe use this as training for a certain um, more stringent uh, accuracy metrics, but if you're actually using it as a crafting collaboration tool or for content generation, um, then that's more open for interpretation. And so I found some of the best examples in those realms. So getting into that, um, oh, let's see if the video actually play. So this example is really interesting. We have um, some research coming out of the University of Toronto where they used a um, convolutional neural network and an RNN to label scenes um, where there is a book that got converted into a movie. So you have something where there was an alignment in both the visual data and the text data. And, and so as a result, you can actually train a model that within this space you can input um, text data that doesn't have that doesn't really have a visual correspondence, but then you can use that model to, to find within that space a visual representation that was similar to it. So you have some actually funny examples in, um, oh, this is in PDF, so I actually can't play it. Sad. Okay, so I'll provide the link later, but basically what happens is that um, there was one which they tested if it worked. So the first clip was of this scene in Harry Potter, which obviously got converted to movies, so they were able to just align it perfectly. Uh, from the narration to the actual scene. And the second one was actually, a, a, um, I guess, well, this one was made to a movie, but they restricted the actual movie that was, um, that corresponded to it to see if it could find something else in the genre of film that was close to it. So it was actually a clip from Fifty Shades of Grey, but they uh, aligned it with, um, some scene from Batman, but it was actually very similar in ambiance and the dialogue was similar. So it, it, it actually performed really well in these two examples. Um, but yeah, so check it out. I'll provide the link later. 
Um, but yeah, bringing it back to also tech, you have uh, design can be influenced by these generative methods. So here it's actually quite an obvious example. You um, yeah, images to a sequence to sequence model, like the sequence being the code that generates the actual web page output. So what you're learning here is that you have a lot of examples of what you want to render and the code that renders it. And then ultimately then you can input an example, like you can sort of, you know, whiteboard what you actually want to render, and then it would generate the code. That is a good approximation from this. So um, some results that came from both Airbnb and, and other sources were, were giving uh, very good, um, uh, very good performance of, of models that do that. Yeah, is that, is that clear? So I don't know if I gloss over that too quickly, but it, it's it's really super cool. I mean, like because the data sets are quite available for the code that generates the um, the, the web pages that uh, that code is for, you can you can you know you can just automate this process. So um, I'm not trying to put web web programmers out of business, but you know now now their work can maybe be easier. You can be like, okay, I want to design this, and then all the junk code that you don't you know boilerplate code that you don't want to write, it gets automatically uh, outputted to you. So then for a startup idea, it's like how do you create tooling that it, it enables people to use this in a very user friendly way. This is kind of the stuff that you can really brainstorm and think about um, from a founder point of view. Okay, so this is actually a little fun. It came out of um, also a workshop out of NIPS last year. But what I liked about it was, you know, obviously you can do stuff, generative methods for drawing, and you can imagine uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, things in the news about how good GANs can uh, or how well uh, generative adversarial uh, networks can produce uh, high fidelity, high resolution pictures. In this example, what was nice is that they incorporated into the model the levers for also controlling what the output is like. So yes, they're all generating um, uh, anime pictures, but in particular, the generated pictures all had um, fixed conditions of like, you wanted the output to have silver hair, long hair, she had to blush, smile, and have an open mouth and blue eyes. And, uh, and then they gave several examples of that. And so as you can imagine, um, from a foundry perspective, what you want to be able to use these models and tools for is like how, how, how do you think about people's um, you know, jobs when, they're, when these animators are creating these tools, like they want to be able to control these parameters and you can actually adapt the model to, to be able to express that. So it's not just a matter of like, oh, it can generate cool images, but like, how do I make this useful so that these animators would actually use it as well? Um, and I think that um, the fact that these models are so flexible um, uh, is just like ripe for application in all of these domains. Um, okay, so the last is gonna be, oh, this is unfortunate because I sent the PDF file, so the uh, music uh, samples won't be on here. So, um, yeah, this would, would have to be provided as a link. But what's really, I, I basically what happens here is I, um, there, so w we all know that like music, very structured, you can read sheet music and try to generate sheet music. This is not news. We've done this prior to deep learning, we've done this with decision methods, something very low dimensional, et cetera. But uh, what was nice here is that um, what really makes music super, um, I guess like, you know, performance apart from just the composition different is that the rendering of particular um, pieces in and of itself is, it, it is art. And so what was nice about this research paper um, was that they, uh, they, they took it upon themselves the challenge of like, can we render music in a way that is close to uh, concert level uh, performances? Um, and, also, uh, and also, of course, generate the content themselves. And it just came, it really, um, even though the hard part is trying to do some, maybe a very long piece and keep the kind of global structure interesting, but in terms of the, the short 60 second pieces they generated, it was indistinguishable, if not more interesting, than a lot of things that you uh, could listen to. So, um, yeah, I, I wish I could play it, but uh, next time, uh, or I'll give, give a link to the website, because it really is excellent. Okay. So um, now that we've sort of looked at, through all these success stories, um, just a you know, discussion of like what, what is still hard 
um, right? Because it's not just like, oh, yay, all of these triumphs. There's still plenty to figure out and also plenty to address in the non-technical realm. So first of all, adversarial examples and also, you know, um, kind of AI ethics uh, more broadly concerned. So in the case of adversarial examples, you have powerful and brittle representations um, so we need to understand what these weaknesses and vulnerabilities are, and there's a lot of interesting research being done there. But on the broad, broader level of AI ethics, how do, we, how do our biases get exposed to models and how do we become more aware of where these models break down or are most vulnerable to biases? Um, super important discussion as well, and I've obviously not covered that. Um, but I mean, hopefully having a better framework to understand where these advancements are leading, you can have a better intuition for like wh where biases can seep in. Um, causality is another whole bag of these models really don't give us um, the ability to propose counterfactuals and test and intervene. So um, that can't be replaced by just doing an end-to-end -end approach. And so just being mindful of that in the, des the design of what your, um, I guess, the products that you're trying to design, et cetera. Um, and then finally, the, the real substrate of, and I kind of alluded to this in the talk, is you, know, you, you have a whole body of infrastructure that is kind of still in the nascent stages of being developed to deploy these deep learning models and, uh, and, and really kind of allow AI to seep into various factions of an enterprise. And so that, uh, that there's a lot to do there. There's on the compute substrate layer, on the, um, uh, on the more systems layer of creating the right abstractions. So I mean, just even simple problems of like, you can write a, you can write a very simple deep learning model, but if you want this to run at pro production level with, um, you know, in different clusters and massive parallel um, kind of capacity, that's very hard because the kind of uh, abstractions you need there are very different from the ones that were exposed in like MapReduce. So, you know, there's different ventures there, somewhat coming from academia, somewhat from industry, but that remains to mature as well. So there's exciting work in, in, in startups focusing on just the infrastructure layer. So in sum, I kind of you know, talked about three really important principles that I found uh, useful to highlight about differentiable programming, and that's couched as a way to um, view the advancement in deep learning and where do you anticipate advancements and, and, and uh, products. So uh, the first is the feature engineering is done by optimization, not you. Um, and Second, that we're very, it's very suitable to end-to-end -end approaches. And finally, it has an incredible potential as a generative method. So just to finish off the story, I'm going to go back to this picture um, of Gongbach. So um, this very strange, uh, but I think actually a very beautiful object, uh, satisfies a delicate constraint. So we needed massive amounts of compute to iterate and test and be able to achieve this uh, arrive at this shape and, uh, and solution. But interestingly enough, um, there's actually Gombach found in nature. The tortoise shell evolved to the shape um, because nature gets to explore complex spaces. It runs in parallel many experiments because it has the computational capacity of reality. So um, I guess what's interesting is we can sort of use this as inspiration. We look forward to really just using the framework of differentiable programming to be able to have that level of optimizational capacity and, and give us really beautiful and exquisite optimizations um, as well. So yeah, thank you. We are going to open up to questions. So audience first. Or we can jump over to Twitch. Right. So uh, one question that, um, let's see here. Uh, Light Skin Zeno is wondering, how is this company secure and know that their AI is better than the average uh, AIs in other companies? Like, how do, you, how do you compare yourself to your competition? Well, how to compare yourself, there's probably more empirical metrics. I mean, specifically comparing the AI, there's like so many different ways to um, like, what, what does AI mean in that context? So I'll answer that. Do, do they have an option to refine their question, or? <laughs> so the usual ways of comparing your company is just to see, do you have traction? If you're really early stage, have you sort of found a problem that people want to use and demonstrate interest in using? I think that's more important than saying, comparing like the algorithm performance on a very you know catered data set because that's not going to build something that people want to buy like you need to go out and talk to customers if yes, if it's if it's um if it's solving the problem that your customers have and uh it's doing that well then you're in good shape 
So if you see it being solved by other people in more efficient ways, then you're probably behind the bar at that point. Yeah, yeah. And some of this is kind of also designing instrumenting processes where it becomes more sticky to switch from using your product versus somebody else's. So there's, a, there's an element of trying to create a moat for yourself. But direct comparisons of algorithmic performances are rarely a good uh, kind of moat to build for your business. How do you assess when, uh, you know, you've been building something for five, like two years, let's say, you deploy it, but now you see other offerings out there. How do you, how do you decide to continue building on what you're doing or start to leverage these, these other algorithms that might exist? Oh, yeah. So I think actually what's really, it's a great question. Um, you want to spend on the, you want to spend your time on things that are not, are basically, it should be hard for, um, for most people. So if there are commoditized open source offerings, you should use those things. You should not spend your time, unless they're actually really key to getting a degree of um, performance that if you use something open source, you can't. Um, but I wouldn't say, you know, because a lot of these things are getting kind of commoditized and I expect building up the infrastructure uh, um, side of the ecosystem is just gonna get more mature with time, so don't reinvent the wheel. Kind of set your sights out for building, you know, starting to work on develop one of these models. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you know where you should aim, right? If you're aiming one year out, everyone else will probably catch up at that point. So, mm -hmm. what? How do you stay on top of that to figure out how far ahead you should be planning for developing this, this capability? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a so it depends on if if you're a researcher, I guess, because it's like if you're a startup, you really shouldn't be just developing models and trying to solve it, approach it from like a, a research point of view, because that's not gonna be your, mo as you suggested in the question yourself, like people are, it's competitive because it's, a, and it's supposed to be collaborative as well. So everyone's kind of edging uh, at the frontier a little bit. So, um, but I think one part of that question which resonates in the area of hardware development, um, in the sense of like you actually have this problem where you can't anticipate all the successful architectures that might you know, pres persevere in the next five year to 10 year timeline, and then you're trying to design hardware, which takes a much longer time to mature, and so there's a careful balance there. Um, but as for kind of developing in-house the research arm, it's, it's a very hard battle to fight, and I, I'm not looking for teams that, I mean, unless they're really the, the top people, experts in that area, doing an application that's very, like, it's a very grounded application in the real world, but it, it, you know, there's only like maybe two teams in the world that would do it. Then, then I'll make a bet on the team, but most of the investments that we do are not like algorithmic advances in a particular area. You just can't, you can't sustain a mode there. I have a question up here. Oh, question back here. Hmm? Sorry. Um, maybe just to um, build on that first question, add some context around it. So, for example, in cybersecurity, Mm -hmm. um, and with the RSA conference just happening down the road. I was there yesterday, and there's a ton of companies that claim to be using machine learning and AI in predictive an uh, analysis yeah. um, and in the, in the cybersecurity space. So as an investor or a customer, um, without actually being able to yeah. run models or test a product, what are the kind of things you'd look for or questions you'd ask to try and figure out you know, who's, who's leveraging machine learning better or in, in the kind of way that would be more effective? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, because that was definitely something that I see a lot in pitches. Um, I mean, it's a combination of things. Like, if they designed a product where you really saw a unique way to, to engage with customers and therefore collect data that no other company could be collecting, it's, it's, it's almost like they've spent a lot more time thinking about how to develop that product rather than the model that uses that data, at least in the early stage, would be you know, it would be more key slash convincing. Um, in the case of just, oh, we're using machine learning for X, and you're like, okay, this X, it seems like, well, anyone, like, I could start a company using machine learning for X, that's bad. Um, so, you know, and those are two extremes. But in the, in the middle, there's also, like, you check for background and execute, try to um, kind of assuage your execution risk. So if this is a team that maybe the idea seems you know, you're willing to trade off maybe the uniqueness of, a, of approach for the maturity of a team's background and how, because you can see that there's multiplicative execution risk that would actually be the hard part rather than um, a particular um, model approach. Because, you know, oftentimes we're not using the most cutting edge deep learning either. It's just like, hey, 
have I, <laughs> have I applied logistic regression properly in this context? Because you want to scale it to production levels, et cetera. Um, we have about 5,000 people on Twitch and the wow. very well received. I want to pass one piece of feedback and compliment and then one question. Okay. So Monster Hunter Unite says, she should start her own Twitch channel. She's very good at explaining this stuff. So compliment back to you. <laughs> and then Walsh9 wants to ask, what do you see as the largest challenges for companies taking a non-vertical AI product approach? For example, tools, platforms, developer, um, or developer tools. What are suggestions? Uh, what are Some of the challenges oh. uh, when you're taking a non-vertical AI product approach. It's hard. Um, yeah, I mean, my thoughts on that really vacillate. It's, so I think the, the infrastructure layer, as I kind of alluded to in the last couple of slides, there's a lot of opportunity to develop. Um, don't do like an AI as a service company. I think that's just too hard now. I mean, yeah, just don't do an AI as a service company. Um, I mean, like well, to, to flesh that out in more detail, you have, um, you know, you have so much d development by just even the, the giant, the tech behemoths trying to have more users in their platforms and cloud offerings that you're not going to be able to compete with those open source offerings. So it's, yeah, I, I, I'm very, very skeptical of like if you're trying to offer computer vision as a service, not a good idea. Um, with that said, uh, if you're solving some aspect of deployment infrastructure, like in a more specific set of enterprise customers, I think that's still, there's a lot of opportunity there. So. Um, Kind of understand the pain points well there, and then and then and then work backwards to like what you need to build. Yeah. Uh, to the audience. Do you have hey, uh, I had a question that's sort of similar to the last one. Um, we've gone and pitched to a couple of VCs, and you know, I feel like our approach to using AI is novel. Not necessarily the models we're using; they're pretty much off the shelf, which, as you said, is probably <laughs> the way to go. Yeah. Um, but I find, you know, because the buzzwords are so popular these days, when we went in there and said, hey, we're using a, a, you know, AI or machine learning in a novel approach, like, yeah, okay, that's great, let's talk about other stuff. Is there something you would recommend sort of put, um, to, you know, putting in your deck or, or necessarily pushing forward to kind of make, make that point a little more salient? Because it is one of our differentiators, but they didn't really care because everyone says it. Uh, so you, you understand the question there, sort of? What, what does your company do? It's sort of what, uh, what would you recommend kind of highlighting from a sort of pure machine learning or AI perspective in a pitch deck if you feel like that's necessarily something that's unique uh, relative to your company? I think it would really, I mean, that's why I'm like, what, what does your company do so I can have like a better? Um, so we're using machine learning to, you know, basically build automation. For uh, like For software development. Oh, so software, oh, okay. Yeah, so I mean, I would, at least, for, from what I would look for, what is that particular workflow that you're kind of extracting data from so that it's, it's different from somebody who's going to go and scrape GitHub or some other, or I don't know, coding contest, which is a little bit more clean. Like, I, I want to know like, how, how this is not a project that somebody else can also start up very easily. Like, you've kind of thought through what is the quality um, data that you're collecting from a very specific workflow so that you can solve this and de-risk the technical aspect of it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, just going to more, de but this is also kind of my bias because I like going to detail about that technical stack, so. <laughs> okay, well, come talk to Amplify then. <laughs> There's a, a question in from Twitch from, I love these usernames, uh, Side Hustle Live would like to know, <laughs> When investing in AI ML products, how do you go about validating the statistical significance that that company claims, i.e. Uh, biomed startup, such as mm. one that may start with T, uh, perhaps exagger exa exaggerating the results? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I find like everyone, their cousin is doing a bioinformatics startup now. So uh, in that, I mean, absolutely I'm very skeptical <laughs> of accuracy claims there. I think. Also, it's just, you know, there's usually a step of, oh, I'm partnering with a pharma company or I'm creating, I'm getting a public data set here or I have the propriety data set there. But, I mean, pharma companies are actually fairly sophisticated in, in their uh, statistical offerings. So if you're really trying to use deep learning for something, like I, I would like to see a platform where you're actually maybe automating experimentation in some way. So you're actually collecting very, uh, unique data, but also in a way that is going to address the sample complexity of like 
what you want to train your model towards. So it's, it gets, it, I, I'm not a bio expert, but I think that stuff is really hard. So I, I'd also want to see somebody who's not just like machine learning native trying to bust in and say, hey, I can solve genomics, <laughs> et cetera. Like, I'm very skeptical of that. Um, so yeah, just going back to the original problem, I think, I, I doubt um, a, you know, quality investor is just gonna like look at some uh, metric of accuracy and, and just be impressed with that because starting a company is not like winning a Kaggle competition. Like there's a lot more nuance to like what that metric uh, maps onto the real world, so. The whole process around due diligence is making yeah. sure that the investigation's happening and that the numbers add up. Um, question for the, perfect, that's so convenient. When it comes to user interface design and software, mm -hmm. um, when you're testing as a user experience director or what have you, you obviously didn't have a lot of bias, cognitive biases. Is there any differential program or machine learning that's managing that in terms yeah. of discerning the type of biases that are there and then creating interfaces to sort of compensate or direct um, yeah. these users? No, that's a great question. Actually, I'm trying to look for companies in that area. I know that at least Facebook's interested in acquiring things like that. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, any other question from the audience? You briefly mentioned AI ethics, but then didn't go into it. I know. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> want to yeah. give us some dirt? <laughs> oh, dirt. Um, don't want to launch it. No, I, I mean, I think it's an important issue. It's just, it's, it's probably deserving of a uh, talk on its own. Um, I just didn't want to kind of neglect it because I, I ended on a positive note and I, because I do want to highlight all of the, you know, possible things that you can do with this stuff, but like with that said, it's like part of that is also just exposing, hey, this is actually what, where the power lies, so if you use it incorrectly, here are all the problems. And so especially if you're a consumer facing product, it's like, you know, we've seen the, the recent troubles with Facebook, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's something I'm meditating on, uh, but I definitely want to create content in that area as well. We can chat later if you want. Yeah. Uh, last question. Uh, hi, um, I'm a founder of uh, the, whatever you mentioned as Infrastructure 3.0, uh, AI infrastructure. Um, the question I, in particular what I had was, uh, infrastructure is a pretty big piece. So when, when somebody is building it, they have to think, uh, obviously have to be a little bit forward thinking. Since AI itself is evolving, does it forward thinking has to be four or five years down the line or it has to be immediately a year or two now? Oh, where, how forward thinking have to be? Yeah, uh, because there are a lot of, lot of uh, moving parts and yeah, yeah. because it's a new, new infrastructure altogether, so that's what. No, that's fair. I mean, especially I guess with infrastructure stuff, it's like very generational as well, um, so I see where that concern is. I mean, obviously, as more forward thinking as you can be, but the, the, the balance there is that if you are assuming more risk to be more forward thinking, you might actually be more wrong <laughs> in the meantime. So um, I think it's, it's just a balance of like talking to your customers, seeing what they're willing to buy now, but anticipating what they'll need later. It might not be too satisfying, but that's, you know, we see it every day. That's kind of a struggle with, uh, with startups kind of thinking about how, like what level of abstraction is like not too much that it's not useful, but enough that it will sustain and be used. Um, so hear your pain there. Perfect. Uh, Alicia, thank you very much. Uh, you. Please, round of applause. <laughs>